I'm looking at the man in the mirror, I need a break Stress waves on my soul until it starts to ache Time pass on these past tracks, what a waste And I'ma let you in for a moment, they so said He holding a rock, told it a block, go your burn to my town We are here Wednesday night Spitting with Spitter Many humbled blessings to everyone out there that's tuning in before we get this show started, I want to get some things out of the way. First and foremost, this episode is sponsored by Mom and Pop CBD Shop. Go over to 312 Town Boulevard, or uh, one second, hold on, let me get that correct address. 312 Town Center Road, Center Boulevard in Easton for all your CBD needs. I use the pain relief cream on my knees, it works wonders. Tell them Large Marge sent you, and they will give you the appropriate <laughs> treatment. Um, tune in to 2M1L Media on YouTube. Tune in to 2M1L Media Facebook group. Home Team Sports has a Facebook group. Spitting with Spitter has a Facebook group. Go like all of that. You catch all our shows there. We have Around the Turnbuckle, Saturday, Sundays at 6 p.m. with the Big Al Boski and Professor Keith. We got Cypher Knowledge with Chrissy, Sunday nights at 8 p.m. We have Home Team Sports, 6 p.m. Tuesday nights. And we got Spitting with Spitter Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock with me, TJ Spitter. Now my guest, who served in the Army with the 25th Infantry, the veteran, Anthony Duran, my brother, many blessings. I'm humbled that you would accept the invite to come on the show. TJ, like I said before, I'm, you know, honored. And uh, when you asked me, it was, you know, truly humbling uh, to, you know, to come on and uh, talk shop, man. Um, have this conversation, maybe talk a little bit about the, the taboo subjects that people, you know, maybe not talk about so freely uh, on the uh, live webcam or, or what have you, but uh, Dan Prince says, hi, Anthony. Danny we're gonna Prince. Have, we're going to have some comments coming in, and as they come in, I'm going to pull them up so you can see them. You know, and it's I funny, like, like, if you have children watching this show, I'm going to keep the cursing to a minimum, but the things that we are going to be talking about may not be suitable for younger ears. Like Aunt said, some of the taboo things. Alan and Amy's chiming in. What's up, family? Real fast, before we get started, tune in Saturday night at 6 p.m. as Around the Turnbuckle has on the WWE Hall of Famer Stevie Ray from the Harlem Heat. Tune in 6 p.m. Saturday night. And Debbie and Bowden, one of our many mothers, chimes in hey anthony thank you for your service man absolutely thank you, brother thank you thank, thank you, you so much for your service thank you everyone and that, i'm telling you that's gonna mess with my add right now <laughs> that's stuff what, coming up i'm gonna be in mid conversation I'm gonna, you know just just stop no i'll be all right i'm just, I'm no, just it kidding. kills mine too because i'm like so <laughs> laser focused in yeah once i get started i'm like oh Ah, I gotta pull it up because they wanna they wanna send their love. So yeah, no, I appreciate it. No, you know, uh, uh, send whatever. But I'm just letting you know it's it's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if I pause, you know why? You know, so absolutely. So let's get into it. What was the defining moment in your life, right? That you you said, "All right, Alpha's cool, Phillipsburg's cool. I want to join the military." Yeah, so uh, growing up, uh, you know, with my three brothers, um, you know, we always played, we always called it guns, right? So we were always intrigued by guns, always taught how to respect them and, and uh, that lifestyle. But I never wanted to join the military. You know, that that wasn't something that I thought about even in high school. Um, I went to a local community college and in, in community college, that's when 9-11 happened. Uh, so... When 9-11 happened, that, that changed my trajectory, right, of my life. I think of a lot of people uh, in this country's life uh, that day. Um, you know, that was my hour, Pearl Harbor, so to speak, uh, that big day. Uh, and uh, so I came home, 
we got sent home from uh, school that day. All, all classes were canceled. And then, you know, I sat home and watched the two towers fall. Um, and uh, obviously did something to me internally. I sat there and cried and watched that as, as many innocent lives uh, perished right in front of my eyes. Um, so that did something to me internally. Um, I tried to finish school. Um, that wasn't something that, that uh, I was really motivated to do at that time. So I tried, it wasn't working out. And that's why I wound up joining um, and leaving to go uh, uh, in the army in 2003 in January. So that, that had a lot of impact on me. And that's one of the reasons um, I signed up to join the military. The September 11th has shaken most Americans to the core. But again, thank you for stepping up in such a way. Mm -hmm. your, you. your tour was in Afghanistan from 04 to 05. Can we talk about that? Yeah. If there, and if there's anything we can't talk about, just say, hey, nah, we can't talk about it. I'll move on, you know. Listen, I'm not in the CIA. There's nothing, cl you know, classified that, that I, you know, um, or special, special missions that I was on or anything like that. Um, okay. You know, I was a grunt. You know, I was the front lines. I was grunt. I was on my feet. Um, we get dropped off somewhere in the middle of Afghanistan. And whatever our mission was, that's what we went to go do, whether it would be uh, to catch a, a HVT, which would be a high value target, um, which was just uh, uh, patrolling. Presence Patrol training the ANA, which is the Afghan uh, National Army, uh, humanitarian missions where we would go and give food to the locals um, in, I believe it was October, November of um, uh, 04 was the first presidential election for Afghanistan. And that was um, Sandy Duran, mom. Um, <laughs> so hey, that, that was... You, Mr. Duran. <laughs> Listen, she deserves all the respect and credit, uh, everything she's been through with, with three, you know, three of us now, but all four of us, you know, we weren't the easiest um, of boys growing up. So, but on the military in Afghanistan side, um, so we were uh, guarding the ballots uh, for the pr first uh, presidential election of Afghanistan. So when Hamad Karzai got elected, they actually went, and they would dip their thumb in ink and press on who they wanted to vote. I actually have some of those ballots. I was able to get the, you know, what they were throwing them out or burning them, the, the excess. So I was able to take a bunch home, which, you know, it's really um, uh, old school the way they did it on a piece of paper, put their thumb down. But the interesting thing was, and the amazing thing was that people would walk days just to go to the voting booth to, to vote risking their lives, literally their lives or their family's lives of death, mutilation to go vote because they believed in democracy. They believed in freedom. They wanted to be free um, and have choice. And they were willing to, whether it would be walking, uh, driving, uh, you know, taking a mule, whatever it was to get to that destination. And our, our job at that time was to guard the ballots um, for people to safely vote and then, you know, get them out of there about safely because the Taliban, they didn't want any of that. Uh, they didn't want any of that to happen. They don't, they wanted to have their way. Um, and they did any means necessary to, um, instill fear, um, to have that. So we did, um, a lot of different things over there. Um, you know, and it was just, uh, it was really hot, <laughs> um, right. at times. Um, and then we'd go up into the mountains, uh, in certain seasons and there's a foot of snow. So, um, you know, there's times we were high, you know, in elevation. I think the highest we've got was about 13,000 feet um, above sea level. So, um, you know, it's hard to breathe up there. It's, it's hard to, all we did was walk, I felt like, um, a lot of the time. But it, um, it sucked and was great at the same time. Um, and I know that's hard for people to, to understand if, if you weren't there, but, um, it was about the brotherhood. It was about that connection that I had with, with the, uh, the men I was with, um, a connection like I've ever never felt before with other human beings, guys that, you know, to the left and right had my back, no matter what, um, you know, guys that would die for me and I, for them, that's that camaraderie. That's the brotherhood that we had, that we share to this day. 
Um, I can pick up a phone call or a phone, call one of my buddies um, that I serve with, haven't talked to him in months, maybe even years. And it's just like we talked yesterday. Um, it's just like that. So that's that connection. Um, and that's the connection we lose when we come home. That's mm -hmm. that's the big piece. Uh, we lose that connection. Um, and, you know, on top of everything else, um, you know, emotionally that we're suppressing, uh, uh, trying to flush out, dismiss, minimize, whatever. Um, we come home, but we also miss that support system that we did have while we're over there. When it's it's normal, you know, the way we were living was normal there. We come back here. It's not normal. You know, right. so it, it's a lot of things that, that people deal with when they get back. Men and women, when they get back from service, come back home um, and they struggle. Uh, they struggle a lot. I, I've seen, you know, and I know you personally. Right. So I can say like suicide. Drug dependency, alcoholism are all things that I've seen people turn to because when they come home, you know, it's almost like you're a civilian again, for lack of better terms. And I, I've never been in your shoes, but I could only assume it's the isolation, unrelatable feeling. Mm -hmm. Like you weren't where I was at. How can you relate to me? Right. And you can be in a room full of people and still feel alone. Absolutely. And that's, Absolutely. that's powerful. You know, that that really does something to somebody, and that's when people can spiral and, and with depression. They're already, you know, many symptoms of PTSD, right? So the, you know, the depression, anxiety, sleeplessness, uh, hypervigilance—all these things that are, are you're trying to deal with and minimize, not talk about because you're not supposed to. Um, you know, we're not trained to talk about feelings. Uh, a lot of people don't grow up learning how to talk about feelings or expressing that. So you go there where it's looked down upon basically, and you come home and you don't really let somebody know where you're actually at. Um, no, you, like you play it off. Most you know. of us grew up in, in the, and I'm not categorizing you because I know your mother is watching and I don't think any of our moms had the easiest of jobs. I think we all raised a fair amount of hell, but <laughs> In the early 80s, early 90s, it was the, what are you crying for? I'll give you something to cry about theory. Right. You know, like to where I didn't understand what my emotions or my feelings were till I was like 29, 30. Mm -hmm. Until I actually started working on myself. It wasn't until I was 31 myself. Right. Yeah, when I, when, like you said, when I started to actually work on myself, um, put all the that persona away that I got to be tough. And, and you know, something uh, one of the psychologists said to us when we were leaving country, Afghanistan, we call it, you know, we're in country um, when we we're when we were leaving country, a bunch of grunts, you know, just sitting in this just makeshift tent cafeteria on a fob, a fire forward operating base, a fob. And um, this guy came in with like this freaking guy, you know, like, come on, you know, like some shrink and, and uh, got a heal us and we and we really minimize we look down we talk down upon this like it's not something we're going to do um but he said something at that time and i still remember it and and when i share um you know my story some places i i i share this information because it made sense to me makes sense to me now but it didn't then so he's like when you guys get back we want to um right now you guys are um hard on the outside and soft on the inside when we you get back our goal is to get you guys hard on the inside and soft on the outside. And we all looked at each other like, this guy's crazy. Like, what are you talking about? You know? So, right. and now I get that, you know, when, when we're able to master inner self, right. We're able to understand self. We're able to understand emotions, regulate emotions properly, um, mm -hmm. not react or not say what we were thinking, you know, a lot of times right. it's self-control, right. And it's discipline of, of the inner self and, and regulating emotions. Um, meanwhile, like, you know, the other way would be we always have that armor up. Like, I'm not letting you in. I'm not going to expose myself. The ego is everything. You know, Absolutely. I can't, you can't bruise that or forget no. it. It's, you know, um, we're having yeah. words or we're, I'm, I'm lashing out at somebody. Um, you know, so it's a lot of insecurity too of, um, you know, expressing how you truly feel. And, and just as, and here's like, you know, not to sound cliche or 
label toxic masculinity or anything like that. But as men, men don't want to seem vulnerable mm -hmm. at all. You know, like me now at 40 years old, I'm a giant teddy bear. Like you can catch me crying and expressing my feelings often, mm -hmm. but we're not taught that. We're taught to absorb everything, tuck it all inside. Every six to eight weeks will explode. Mm -hmm. and, and start to cycle all over again, you know, and it's, it's really detrimental for like now I'm, you know, my son is 16 and my daughter is 18. I'm raising young adults mm -hmm. to where like anything that I've learned, I've tried to unlearn myself to teach them that it's, it's okay to have feelings. It's okay to be emotional. It's okay to you process your feelings, go through what you're going through. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Don't sit in like, we're not going to say where we've heard each other talk for, you know, for namesake. Right. But when I speak, you know, I, I tell people like I take me with me everywhere I go. And it just depends on what version of me I'm bringing with me. Mm -hmm. You know, like I could be uh, defected up and be an arrogant, egotistical asshole. Or I could be who I've worked so hard to be now and give you the shirt off my back and be as loving and kind as possible. So with that being said, let's talk about your journey. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you are, man, like there's, you got a wonderful side note. You have a wonderful resume that I want to dive into. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you do, you do so much work for the veteran community. Uh, can we talk about the nonprofit organization, the Active Heroes organization? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, I haven't worked with Active Heroes for a few years now, but that's one of the organizations I first got involved with uh, through a, a gentleman named of Greg Troxel, not the Peabody Greg Troxel, because it's the Eastern Greg Troxel, so no relation. Um, you know, we know P. Berg, like everybody knows that name, right? You know, right. P. Berg, but this is, you know, somebody that's unrelated. So, um, and I got linked up through the um, the Hummers, uh, who were the, his neighbors. So uh, he was working with veterans. He saw that somebody was doing a walk in New York and, and this organization where uh, they set up a, um, a free retreat. It's, I forget how many acres, it's, 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 144 acres, let's say, um, but it's a lot of acres, whatever the acres were. I don't remember. It's been a while. And we were raising money. We were doing walks in the neighborhood. Um, first over in Easton Peeper uh, bike trail, the Delaware Lehigh Valley bike trail. We were doing them over there. Then we'd come out into Easton and, but we weren't getting as much. We want exposure, right? So we want people to know like, why are you walking? Why, why are you have backpacks on walking the streets of wherever? Um, and then we can give them a flyer. And this is what we do. And this is where the money goes. Here's the nine nineties, like, you know, the tax tax return forms that people can look at and understand where, when you donate money to a nonprofit organization, you know, where the money's gone. Is it going to salaries or is it going to actual people that are saying they're helping, you know, so you right. can look at that information yourself and it's all obtainable, you know, um, online. So through that organization, um, you know, we would organize events, have these walks, um, the first walk I did, there's a video of me trying to me trying to walk afterwards. We walked like 26 miles. Um, and mean, you know, mind you, I didn't train for it. I just, you know, my mentality like that, you know, I can go back to that, right? That mentality of like, no, I got, it. I was a grunt. I can walk this and like, like an idiot, you know, um, because I paid for it. You know, I paid for it because I, I we walked and walked and walked and uh, I put like extra weight in my rucksack and um, that hurt. <laughs> you know, so lesson learned. I'm not doing that anymore. You know, I'm not <laughs> I, or at least I'm going to prepare for it. And if I'm going right. to walk like that. But that organization was was um, a, a real opportunity to raise money so veterans can go to this retreat and have access to counseling and camping and archery and four wheel like things they can get away with you know get away for let's say a weekend or so however long they were able to go there and it was free so right. that that's what that money was for um and also they had a um, wellness center where they offered yoga and all kinds of other things for for veterans um hey steph and uh so 
that was my introduction to getting into the nonprofit organizations for or, uh, veterans organizations, right? Um, and through that, I found purpose, you know, and that is something that was powerful to me, being of service, right? Um, that was being of service. That was doing something uh, and giving back, you know, so I can keep what I have. And that's something where, uh, um, you know, where I got sober, that's what they say, you know, and I followed suit and I would do things like that. And I would feel a, 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 a sense in myself that that um, of purpose um, and that would keep continuing, you know, driving me forward. So um, I did Active Heroes for a while. Um, you know, Greg and I organized events through Easton and Phillipsburg. And another thing about that is it got the community together. It got the community together, united, no matter what anybody's beliefs is, left, right, center, green, red, blue, it doesn't matter, right? It's like everybody came because they wanted to support the cause and everybody got along and everybody, you know, had a good time. And what was really powerful is uh, we had a woman, uh, I don't want to name her name, you know, on this, if she's, I don't want to expose anybody, but, um, but I would, you know, if it, you know, um, she was walking her, her husband committed suicide uh, a few weeks prior to that walk. So she was able to come out there um, and it was to raise awareness for, for veteran suicide as well. That was one of the main things, right? The, the number 22, which so many people have seen, but those numbers are skewed. It's, it's most likely a lot more, especially now with the pandemic. Uh, but that was that, that number that everybody knows of veteran suicide, 22 a day. Um, well, her, her husband just committed suicide a few weeks, uh, left uh, a few children behind and, uh, she was walking. She came out to walk one of those, those ruck marches and through that ruck march, she was able to do walk and talk therapy, you know, talk, tell her story, get vulnerable with people, build relationships, build a network of people. Guess what? The relationships that she built there. She came back with those people. She was connected through Facebook, phone calls, meeting up. She was coming back. She was bringing um, her her husband's dad, her widow's uh, dad with her to the uh, Ruck Marches. Uh, she was an active member. It gave her that purpose and, and, and reason again to like fight. So somebody else doesn't have to deal with that. Um, so those are the powerful moments. And, and like sometimes you're like, I don't know, is anybody going to show up? Why do I keep doing this? It's such like a pain in the ass to get all this organized. Nobody listens. No, you know, it's like you you find all these reasons and like that happens. You're like, this is why that that that's why right there. So um, and there's a lot of moments like that, you know, that, that you know, I can sit on here and tell you so many stories like that. And um, but it's a beautiful thing just to be a part of and to witness these things of people healing and that process that they're healing. Um, while it's happening and it's a beautiful thing to see so that was active heroes uh, when i was doing active heroes that's uh you know i i find myself becoming like when i hold when i hold these shows i find myself almost becoming a fan and listening too much and that one just took my breath away a little bit only because like i i, I can empathize really well to what people go through mm-hmm I remember the first time a mother came up to me and had said to me, you shared your story and I listened and I never gave up on my son who was an active drug user because of that. You know, my, my none of my mothers, and I say that in all seriousness, my mother's passed away, but Colleen, Amy and Debbie and Bowden also raised me and they never gave, no matter what I was doing <laughs> out there, they never gave up on me, mm -hmm. you know, and so that just how you you relayed that it took my breath away for a minute, you know. You're also involved in you organized a ruck walk called Carry the Fallen. That's the same one, right? Same so, one. Yeah. So Active Heroes is the whole organization, right? Okay. And, um, I'm sorry, I actually wasn't clear on that. On the I just wrote no, it right fine. next to each other. So yeah. So. Uh, Active Heroes is the or whole the organization as a whole, and Carry and the, the Rubble the Marches itself were called Carry the Fall. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. And uh, you're also on the board for Battleborn. Mm -hmm. And can you explain all that 
Battleborn does. I know because I'm personally friends with a bunch of you guys. But for the people that are listening, can you explain what Battleborn is? Yeah, so Battleborn, uh, so so Active Heroes was was um, in uh, uh, Kentucky, right? So Battleborn is a local Lehigh Valley uh, mm-hmm. veteran organization who helps local veterans and their families. Um, you know, they, they uh, set up certain events. They uh, raise money for families. Um, uh, 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 now we are just starting to, um, I don't try to blast something, but like we're, we're starting to, um, have financial aid for, you know, with, with a, a, a cap on it, of course, um, and an application process, but a lot of families need financial help. Uh, we, we, um, raise money for food banks to help homeless veterans get the packs and the food and, and set up, uh, a lot of these, um, food drives and things like, like that. Um, we, we become a messenger to get them resources as well. So we can, we can operate um, where somebody gives us a call. They need help with something. We act as like, all right, we got you. Let us take care of the rest. Because if anybody has ever been through the VA system or any type of veteran resource, you know, going through veteran resources, you go online, there's about, you know, a hundred thousand of them, maybe 40,000 of them are any good, you know? So that's the reality of it. So you may hit, you know, 25 of them of that, you know, 60,000, that's not good. So what we can do is we have organizations that and resources that are vetted that we link veterans and their families up to. Um, a few months ago, right before the, uh, the pandemic started, um, we started a, a peer-to-peer uh, veteran group as well, right over in Easton on, on Change on 3rd. So we do that every other week now. Um, so it's anybody who's worn a uniform, because also those uh, organizations that I speak of before, if you were discharged in, in any way other than uh, less than honorable, right? So if you're, if it's less than honorable or dishonorable discharge or whatever, something happened and they were using drugs, they may get less than honorable. You know, it doesn't mean that their service didn't matter or what they did overseas right. or, or in their service in general. So that means they can't access certain resources, at, you know, even in the VA. Right. You know, so it's like, what are they supposed to do? So um, those are the, 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 the people as well that we will um, help out and, and uh, with the resources. But the peer group as well is anybody who's wearing a uniform. You come, uh, you talk about what's going on. It's two hours. You can come and go as you please, you know, uh, out of respect to the group and the integrity of it, of course. Um, mm-hmm. But it's a, it's a place where they can come and, you know, share that camaraderie. Um, and what they're going through. It's it's a really good group where people can come and get vulnerable, um, honest, open, and it's through each other is, is how we heal. And we, we actually build that network here in, in um, back home. So we're able to do that and provide that as well. What? So I'm, I'm trying to segue this correctly without being so brash on my normal TJ nonsense, because normally I don't, I really don't give a damn, right? But me and you have, we have, it's a deeper relationship than just me saying, hey, Anthony Duran, um, can you be on my show, right? You helped family members of mine, right? And in turn helped me. Um, how did, how did this start for you? What was the defining moment that you're, okay, you're, you're done in the military now. What is the defining moment to where your life changes? Hmm. Right after the military? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So I got back and, um, you know, trying to find my way in this world. Um, what many veterans do and they struggle, find purpose. Oh, I'm going to do this or what am I going to do that? You know, um, and it was a struggle for me. I did, you know, I was working construction for a while, um, started to pick up drinking. I got out medically because of my back, right? So I got hurt over the um, actually about a month after I re-enlisted for another four years. So, um, you know, I had to get out medically and, and, uh, you know, get a severance pay and all that stuff. And, um, something I didn't want to do, but it's something I had to do. Um, you know, which I wound up getting the back surgery and everything, but through that, um, 
you know, they prescribed me, you know, pain medication for my back. Um, I was already drinking pretty heavy when we got back. So that just kind of segued and continued when I got home. I stopped with the medications, but the drinking still persisted. Um, I was still able to have relationships at this time. I was still functioning, working. Um, and then I started to get back into the medications. Um, and I didn't understand addiction at all. Um, right. I, uh, Most of us don't until. Right. So I was never, you know, like educated on actual addiction and getting hooked right. and what that feeling was like and what, you know, potentially could happen. Um, so I wound up waking up the one morning and I felt like that my skin crawling, you know, that irritability. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Like, why? You know, and I would uh, uh, after work, I came home, I was feeling like that all day. And, you know, I took a pill and I was like, it was done. It was like, just took it all away, you know? And I was mm -hmm. like, what the heck was that? So um, somebody educated me on that. And they're like, oh, you just got to take more. And I'm like, oh, as the, the good addict that I am, it's like that instead of stopping, it's like, oh, okay, I'll, 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 I'll take more, you know? So, um, so that continued throughout years, right? So it was a battle. Um, uh, in, until, um, you know, I got in trouble with the law and uh, uh, wound up looking at some some serious charges and wound up going to rehab uh, because of, of the, the, the trouble I got into and the addiction that I was, you know, facing. So when I went into treatment, I would just compare to everybody. I'm like, I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. I'm not homeless. I'm not this. It's like I, I just came here because I got a little carried away with some pills. That's right. it. Like, right. I'm good. Like I can still drink, I can still do this. I can moderate, you know, like like moderate my um, pill use if I want. It just got over, you know, a little carried away, and I'll take care of it. So I'll be fine. Um, and that, you know, I got out and, and right right back to it, you know, and and progression, right? So we learned about yeah. tolerance, we learned about progression, um, mm -hmm. and so throughout the years it was progression. Um, did things I wasn't proud of, um, you know. Uh, and um, it led me down to multiple treatment centers, uh, multiple detoxes, um, PTSD unit in Lyons, New Jersey. Um, and the last thing I was at was a psych ward for two days um, right after my brother passed and then right into a long term treatment center um, actually is is where I work now <laughs> um, as I'm a I'm able to, to come back and be a counselor there uh, where I got sober in the first place. So um, that was my journey in a nutshell. Um, there's really no substance of, of after I got out of the military of like any um, real accomplishments, really. Um, right. It was just kind of survival. Like, what am I going to do? How do I survive? It was it, it, it was exhausting. It was survival. Um, I had to survive the next day and, and, and not be sick. And it was just like that constant hustle, that constant survival. Um, you know, when I share my story at like a rehab or at a meeting or something like that, I'll get more into detail to kind of qualify a little bit more, but not not the whole log. You know, it's like yeah. here, here's my qualifications. Maybe you guys can identify and relate to that. But on a, on a uh, um, uh, platform like this, you know, I'll save that, um, you know, uh, <laughs> Especially mom's watching, you know, even though she knows a lot of it, you know, but, yeah, um, but you know what, there's, there's a lot of things I wasn't proud of, uh, a lot of shame yeah. and guilt I had to work through. Um, and, um, but things that, that, that we were able to come back from, you know, and uh, so this last place that I went to um, was my lottery ticket in life. It was right after my brother's passing. And I went to the psych ward because my mom begged me to go. Uh, friends were calling me, begging me to go. I said, no, I was basically homeless, nowhere to go. Um, nobody wanted me in their houses uh, because of the things I would do, you know, while I was in these houses to get what I needed to get. And, um, you know, very depressed. I attempted suicide three times during this, during those years. Um, and, uh, you know, by the grace of God, I'm still here. Um, you know, there's there's another reason, there's another purpose. And it was through that process I was able to find that that purpose. Right. And um, I was in treatment, listening to people's stories, this last treatment that I was at. And I started to find little glimpses of hope. I was able to be away from the substance long enough to actually allow these things to start clicking. Uh, the internal work started to happen. And I was able to apply 
like coping skills to my emotions and thoughts and right um you know was able to manage and regulate a little bit better and better and better learn my triggers what triggered me how to, to respond to somebody rather than react or bait them so i can react you know it's like you know, i just learned so much about how i how i am as a as a yeah. person and how i maneuver right yeah. um so it was really it's really cool like to see that you know um and uh you know, we we um, we come to that realization of like change behavior. I need to change this behavior. So that's what happened, right? And then I get out. I started working at a job. I was thirty-one years old, and I'm like, "We're uh, this is not where I want to be." Thirty-one years old, like this is not like, come on, man. You know, like I I, I had stuff, like, and I lost it. All. I lost all of it. Damaged relationships, lost relationships. Um, you know, I just burn every bridge going, going going along that way. And then, um, you know, in there, I, I was able to change. And uh, uh, when I got out, started working. And because um, that's what ha that's what needs that I need to change, right? My behaviors, my thinking, how, how I do things, who I hang out, everything needs to change. Everything, right? everything, <laughs> you know, like, and we talk, we talk to people all the time, like, you can't just change one aspect of your life. And expect everything else to change. Everything about TJ needed to change for me to get here. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't bring the drug dealing thug with me and change everything else. Right. You know, I, and this is going to sound crazy, like, and we were talking about defense mechanisms and those exterior walls. And that was just an exterior wall because I was just a little boy mm -hmm. crying for help. You know, I had to change all of that. Mm -hmm. You have to you have to step out outside of yourself, take a very good look at the damage, the destruction, the degradation and everything that has happened for you to get to that moment. Mm -hmm. And here we are. Now we got to fix it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And the place allowed me to continuously run into myself. Right. I had no right. other choice. It was just like anything that would happen. It came right back on me, came right back on me. And I was forced to look at it no matter how much I tried to run, put up the persona. There's only so much uh, there's only like so long I can hold that pose until right. like there's that breaking point. It's like, well, there you are. There you are. Surprise. And then it's like, all right, let's get to work, you know, and um, that's what it was like. Uh, so started working. um you know, at a golf course uh, for my buddy's uh, uh, father, which was um, awesome experience. It was like really humbling. It's like didn't have much going on. I was like riding the lawnmower, listening to the tunes. It was just like, you know, it was like peace. I was like at peace. It was it was it was crazy. Right. And um, a buddy of mine all uh, said I'd be really good at, at doing this job. It's counseling veterans um, for Rutgers University at a 24 seven peer support line. And uh, I was like, yeah, all right. So I applied in March and they had a freeze and then I wound up getting hired in November of uh, 2014. Yeah. And um, I was doing that for five years, um, been able to travel the country a little bit, doing outreaches for this program, letting, you know, letting people know us, what we do 24 seven. We have clinicians on staff, uh, but it was able to allow veterans to call in with whatever issues were going on. Uh, talk to somebody else that can relate in some way, shape or form. Right. We have that common thread. And then we were able to uh, provide resources at our disposal in our database. And then we were able to we continuously follow up. There were people that I, I was following up for five years. I would still have that relationship with like right. call them every month. It was first. It was like every week. Then it was two weeks. And it was like every month. You know, it's just like. Mm -hmm. You know, on a Sunday, hey, man, what's going on? What's happening? And, and it's like they they always appreciate that, like somebody really cares about them. You know, we're not just like the business, you know, because um, yeah. we have to do it. It's like, no, um, because people can fall through the cracks. And that's what happens uh, far too many times with within the veteran and, and addiction world. So uh, I tell people all the time, you'll be surprised on how far a smile can go. Mm hmm. You'll be surprised on how far being kind to someone. And I'm not talking about going out and finding somebody and giving them money or but just be kind and genuine. Right. You know, and, and human, if you would, mm -hmm. and how far that would go. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We uh we both shared somewhat of the same occupation as and no, occupation isn't the right word, but 
being recovery specialist for ORB, which is the opiate over opiate overdose recovery program. Mm -hmm. What was that? I, I have my own story, but what was that like for you? Getting hired or, or actually getting the calls or both? Getting the call. Getting hired is one thing, but like getting the calls. Yeah, getting the calls. It's it's uh because I remember being in, in that bed, right? Of right. an overdose. And um right. you know, so I'm able to go in there and, and I'm not there to sell them anything. Um, I'm not there to tell them what they need to do. Uh, I'm not there to analyze them. I'm not there trying to uh uh work them clinically into um any type of treatment i'm there to meet them where they're at and that is it so that's when i'm there that's the mindset it's like listen if you don't want to hear me that's fine but you know i want you to have these resources and when you're ready here's my number give me a call because we're here we all we want to do is help we're not calling the cops we're not getting you right. in trouble um because that's that's a lot of their fear because some people have kids you know and they're like life is going to get yeah so I just want people to get that help. So going in there in the hospital, uh, 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 and, and um, getting that call and going there, whatever time I do seven to seven, 7 PM to seven at night because I work during the day. So right. I do it three days a week and uh, you know, it, it's very um, eye opening, humbling and uh, keeps me green all in the same. It, so. it sure does. I, you know, and not to cut you off, the very first call that I got, I had no idea what I was going to say. So I said a little prayer before I walked in the room, you know, like guide my will and my tongue because I'm clueless at this mm -hmm. point. I just want to help somebody. And I remember the first question I asked this person, I was like, is there, is there a loved one that I can call that needs to know that you're here? You know? And they said no. Hmm. And it, I had to remove myself from the yeah. room for a minute because it crushed me. And it, and when you say it keeps you green, it took me right back to 2009 mm -hmm. when there was no hope, right? And I was out. I was so ready to just call this life quits. It mm -hmm. took me right back there. And I said, you know what? There's got to be there's got to be some sort of reason why we're doing these things. Right. And it is like like you said, the most. Humbling. Gratifying blessing that I've ever been a part of. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So so it, it's it's. um. You know, it, it's one of those experiences where I, I wish that job didn't exist. If, you know, because we, you know, uh, uh, due to not having anybody overdose on drugs, obviously, uh, but, right. you know, it, it's a great um, start to, it's a reactive start, right? We're being right. reactive to somebody's overdose. We, I think we need more preventative stuff. Um, Absolutely. You know, but at, at the same time, it, it, it's something that the state has done in, in New Jersey up and down, Um you know, the, the states and different hospitals. And, and you know, uh, it's fortunate that we have one around here or a couple around here to, mm -hmm. to at least have that, that when people do wake up, because I remember sitting there, I woke up, I was a a-hole, man. Oh, oh my yeah. God, I was pissed. And like, yeah. this doctor didn't know what he was talking about. Get this stuff off. Yeah, I was like pulling the shit out of my, my arm. I was like, get me out of here. And it's like, dude, you were just on the floor dead. And right. like, the arrogance entitlement you know and it's so it's like who do who do i think i was you know like who who was i like people are saving my life and i'm angry we we carry a level of mr invincible Ooh. if you would thinking that nothing could hurt us mm -hmm. until it's too late and <laughs> then and then the ego comes in like i don't need your help mm -hmm. i'm fine mm -hmm. what yeah yeah, even though your life is an absolute disaster, you have like literally yeah. no relationships, no money, um, nothing to show for what's going on, no purpose, no job. You know, that's where I was at at that point. And I remember going home. My uncle actually took me uh, back to where I was staying and he came into my room and he looked at this big brown bag, right, of um, it's like a sandwich bag full of medications from the VA. And he said, Anthony, and he's in recovery. He's like, Anthony, how do you expect to stay sober taking all this medication i'm like what are you talking about i need it 
literally right. about 10, 11 to 16 medications that I was taking. Right. I didn't even know what I was taking most of them for. Um, mm -hmm. I knew the narcotic ones, which ones I was taking, <laughs> you know, I was getting, That's taking them to, to, to forget everything. But I mean, we there was any depressions and sleep meds and heart pressure medication, you know, uh, I was just like, what the, today I take no medication, you know, um, and that's a gift. I try not to. Yeah. You know? No, and I'm not, I'm not down. I'm not like, uh, oh yeah, no, no, no. Um, I, every now and then, but it messes with my stomach. I'll take an ibuprofen for my knees or whatever, mm -hmm. but that's yeah. the extent of it. Yeah. That's, that's what I take, you know, when my back yeah. hurts or something, I have ibuprofen and I forget to take it a lot of times, which I'm like so thankful for that. I'm not yeah. trained that way anymore. I was so conditioned to like get up pill, get up pill, get up. And it's just like, I'm like, I get up like, oh, I'm paying. Like maybe I'll take an ibuprofen today. And it's like, I'll walk out the door and I'll get to work. I'm like, oh, man, I'm hurt. I'm like, I didn't even take an ibuprofen. Damn, I forgot. Thank God. You know, and it's right. just like, I don't need it. It helps. And sure. um, but that's like conditioning the brain the other way. But I had to be willing to actually put forth the effort. Right. And mm -hmm. I had to learn more about what I was going through when I was, you know, uh, withdrawn physically. And then when I was withdrawn psychologically with like pause, right. Post acute withdrawal syndrome, uh, the, the effects that it still has on people, which a lot of people don't even understand is they think like you're doing your seven day detox. And it's like, as soon as the physical stuff is gone, it's like, all right, now I'm good. You know, I can go do this, but they forget and don't really understand, not forget if they were never really educated on it, but if they can educate themselves that they're going to experience, you know, some people will experience uh, post-acute withdrawal for up to a year or two, you know, um, and it's the effect, it affects the brain, the dopamine levels, different parts of the brain where cognition, reward, uh, emotions, memory, right? So it's all hijacked. Your thinking right. is hijacked. That's why in recovery, we say it's like, don't think, you know, uh, just, just listen, you know, yeah. don't make these decisions yourself without talking to somebody else. And that's why it's like, because it's so important in early recovery that people do that. And it was so important for me to finally listen to people when I didn't want to, in order to actually have the experience that they were talking about moving forward. Absolutely. You know? to, this, to this day, right. And I've been, I've been coming around for a long time. I still run major decisions past my network. Mm -hmm. I have to. At the moment that I, you know, at, the first thing I do is I pray. You know, I pray on it. And then I start, to, you know, running that decision or, or what's on the plate around uh, past my people. Because at the moment that I think I got this and I think I can do it myself, I know, I know how that cycle starts with me. You know, like, mm -hmm. and that, and that's a scary place for me. Yeah, it really, it really is. And, and, and through the recovery process, right. We, we, we uh, hear it all the time. Like we, we talk about it where I, where I work, right. It's like, we're trying to work on the components of mind, body, and spirit. Right. right. So let's say we get them back and then we're, I'm out and in, in, in recovery. And the first, unfortunately, the hardest to get while mind and body come the quickest because your, your body's healing, your mind's getting clear. I can do this. I'm good. I don't need this shit. Like I'm, I'm, I'm good. I know what to do, you right. know, left to their own device, you know, without mm -hmm. any really good, uh, healthy coping skills that they've learned or applied. And then, but they really haven't gotten in touch with their spirituality, whatever that may look like. Right. Yeah. It's not religion. It's, it's just some form of connection. Right. right. It just can't be you. That's, it just can't be you, right? Something, That's it. something better That's or it. greater than yourself. Just can't I just, be you. Yeah. I just tell people, like, listen, it just can't be you. That's it, right? You are not some higher power, higher, like, just don't let it be you. That's it. So right. my decision uh, making got me here. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. You know? But unfortunately, TJ, it, it's the, um, the spirituality is the first, it's the hardest to get, right? Because my right. body, and then it's the first to go. Right. And then mind and body. Right. So um, and, and then you see it all the time and, and you see you see this in, in, in that world of people coming in and going. Uh, I see it at my treatment center, which is long term, which people are there a, a better part of a year in, in, in patient treatment, you know. Um, and but you actually get it. But you also get to see that the shift, you know, the transition no matter. It, it could be months down the line until you can you can just see it like. Stop fighting. And they just stop fighting. 
stop fighting themselves and you can see it sometimes and, and it's a beautiful thing um but unfortunately lifted yeah, yeah but unfortunately most of us don't get this you know and yeah. and it sucks but that's the reality of it and um you know there are people out there trying to do their best to, to help guide people that are really struggling as well um people who care you know and not only to i wanted to get i wanted you to come on tonight so i could give you your flower right while you're here and just tell you that i love you unconditionally and thank you for all that you do but to end that stigma that no i'm not a junkie no mm. i'm not a crackhead you know what i mean mm -hmm. is i was somebody that was fighting something that was much more powerful than me mm -hmm. and i had no idea what i was up against and i didn't have the information or the tools to fight it mm -hmm. You know, and that's why I'm glad I had you on so we could have this free conversation, this open conversation, this open dialogue about our journeys, if you would, and, and the struggles. Like, I find myself to this day, like, I still get wound up. Mm -hmm. But we have these toolboxes now to where, like, I could just step aside and, and play the tape all the way through and take a deep breath. Anthony, how do you, what do you, on your spiritual journey, what does the next five years of your life look like if you had to be a magic eight ball, if you would? <laughs> that's, that's, um, I don't, uh, and, and I don't normally know. I don't ask people that far out because I live just for today. Sometimes yeah. I count it by the minute. Yeah, you know, so so I, I, that's really hard for me um, to answer, to be honest with you, because it's too far. Um, right. Yeah, we can have goals, we can have plans. Um, I, maybe I'll give you some of, of, of uh, maybe goals that I do have. You know, so right. some of the goals is, you know, as you know, I'm um, I'm a counselor. I'm, I'm on the uh, uh, clinical track uh, as far as uh, getting my master's licensed, um, getting my social social work degree licensed, um, getting my LCADC. Um, these are things that, um, within five years, I'm, you know, um, one, one, actually both of them within the next couple of months, I hope they're done and complete and finished, but, um, the pandemic has slowed a lot of paperwork and things like that down. Um, but at the same time, um, that's, that that's that's what I can think of right now, right? Because I, I don't know, I really don't know, you know. Because I, I don't. And that's a, and that's a <laughs> great <laughs> answer. And I and I did it to throw you on the spot because we think the same way and we practice the same practices. So if somebody asks me, people ask me all the time, "Where do you see you in five? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Well, I mean, I'm just, it, I'm just happy to be here. You know what I'm saying? Like, when you giving me a job interview? What do you see in yeah. five? You know, which when, when you see yourself in five years in this company? You know, and it's like that's a little different. You know, um, but how I live is much different than, than that. You know, and, and I try not to. I try to stay in my lane here. You know, right. because I can live in the past, right? It's easy for me to go back there. Um, mm -hmm. I have to be careful of that, right? And it's easy for me to project into the future. And that can really throw off uh, where I really need to be, which is right here. Because then I start to to really lose focus on like the now and like, what do I need to do? And that can be, you know, um, um, very distracting to what I really need to do. Um, you know, but and then that causes concern or, or things I can't control. And I try to control them and they're like it didn't even happen yet. You know, so um, these are things I have to watch for on a daily basis. You know, yeah, and, and it's just something point. that, yeah, it's just something that, like, that's that's it, but that's okay. Like, right. I'm, I'm aware of it, you know, mindful of it. I, I try to practice that too, of being like mindful of like certain thoughts or feelings and being okay with it, but then like bringing it back to like, here we are, we're on, we're on this conversation, this is where I am, right? But um, being mindful of certain traveling thoughts, maybe, you know, um, but being able to bring it back is, is the main thing. I, I and I'm the listen, I'll be the first to tell you I drop the ball every day, one way or another. I oh, fall yeah. short every day. Don't put me on a high pedestal, it'll be a long fall, right? <laughs> For real. But like yeah. I just worry about today and what I can control today and what I can't control today. 
And, you know, and I thank my higher power every day that I wake up. It's like, you know, people ask me all the time. I'm like, yo, I woke up. It's a blessing. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, people look, look at me like it's like some sort of dumb cliche. Like, no, I'm seriously mm -hmm. happy to be here. Well, I, uh, and that just, but those are like the reminders, right? Of, and I just had that thought of like what that was like waking up, very uncomfortable, sick, having no money. How am I going to get the next drug so I can, you know, feel better, right. you know? And like, people are like, why don't you just stop? Or why don't you just go to treatment? You know, because it's like, after you've been there so many times and it's like, it's not working. Cause well, one, I never worked the program, you know? Right. Um, and two, it's like, once that allergic reaction is, is triggered, it's like, I have no, I literally have no choice. Like it's, I'm, I am hijacked, you know, and right. there's no excuses for what I've done. There's a reason for it, but there's no excuses whatsoever. I'm not, I'm not excusing any type of behavior by any means, but, um, Certain things happened, like I said, that I wasn't proud of, but like waking up on those mornings, like, oh my, it, it was just like that, that feeling of darkness, hopelessness, wanting it to end. Um, and, you know, I, I, I again, like I said, I, I, I attempted that, you know, and it was a deep, dark, lonely place even though I had so much love and support from family members, you know, um, and friends, it's just, as I started going down that, that dark, dark path. Um, yeah, sorry. I went off on a tangent here because that, that, no, and that feeling, man, I just, you know, what I mean? going back to that, it's like, it's very real. And it's very, it's very, you're very loud to yeah. have tangents here on mm -hmm. spitting with spitter because my whole damn life <laughs> is a tangent. That's where I can go. It's like, uh, uh, Jamie makes fun of me. It's like, I'm talking about a story. I'm like talking about this and this and next thing I'm like, here I go. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll be having conversations with Jackie and she'll stop me. She's like, how long is this going to take? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're trying to give directions and I'm like giving, you know, uh, 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 places landmarks this that's like just what give me the street you know what i mean just tell me what street i need to be on you know put something let, let me put something in the gps you're giving yeah. me the most roundabout way to get yeah, to the but I still give you landmarks you know i'm like yeah but you want to like just we'll follow the gps thanks i'm like okay <laughs> so, Absolutely. Yeah, man. hey i'm a work in progress that's all i can say me me too man me too and Lee there so many people have comments too many people have commented thanking you for your service I um, it would have distracted you if I would have put them all up. Lee Dare commented, "You are both an inspiration. Thank you both for what you do for others. It's good to see that there are still good people in this world." Oh man, love you, Lee. I miss love Lee. You back, Lee. For real. No, I grew up with Lee and Alpha. We were Alpha boys, man. Yeah. I've heard that word, boy. All right, all right. You know, Listen. But Alpha boy. Lee Lee was uh, one of one of my boys growing up. Um, you know, in Alpha, we had a nice little click in Alpha. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that was fun, man. We we had, we grew up fun. We we always were out doing it, things, and it was you know what? It was a blast. I'm mm -hmm. not gonna lie, I had a blast. We were on, I was First Street, you know. Yeah. So we had the guys from Wilson, like the Hannesacks were on Wilson, Lob. Um, you know, you got the Hummers on Warren, me, mm -hmm. Kiss the Box, uh, Heath Thompson. It was like the Hinkle. It was like so many people like that, that we, we would always play something, whether it was block chase, uh, some wiffle ball, football, tag, just beat the crap out of each other. Whatever it was, it was a game. You know, we made it into a game and uh, it was fun. Tic tacking. <laughs> you know? Mischief night in that general yeah. area. Mischief night yeah. was wild. People are like, "What's tic tacking?" You know, if you go outside of Peaberg or outside of like places that actually, actually have cornfields, you know. Um, yeah, it was Listen, wild. It was we fun. could give you a how-to manual on that as well. Mm -hmm. Before we get out of here, like I'm definitely gonna have you on for a part two because there's so much other stuff that I really didn't get into that I really want to discuss. But I don't like to hold anybody hostage. Cheech, what up, Cheech? Block Block Chase, it. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Is is there anything you want to ask me? I always let the guests. It's it's kind of like cliche or corny or whatever. But I feel like I've been asking the questions the whole time. So, 
I would like to know, is there anything you want to ask me? Hold on, there's more. Bub said, I'm proud to see how far you two have come. Thank you, my brother. Thanks, Bub. Char Love the you. Princess, continue blessed to all of you. Thank you. Is there anything you want to ask me before we pack up shop and get out of here? Yeah. Um, how did you get into this? Like, what inspired you? What... Um, what were some of your goals? Like, what was your avenue of getting into uh, interviewing other people, getting their story out there, getting your story out there, being a, a voice, you know, having your face out there? Um, how did you like what inspired you to do it? Why did you know what's the reasoning behind you sitting here doing these podcasts? Damn. Damn, man. Damn. <laughs> um. So everybody like would ask me all the time, like, how comes you don't do music anymore? Right. I don't know if it's because I fell out of love with music or I just. I'm, I'm very like I'm wired. We're wired similar. So it's very hard for me to create all the time. Mm -hmm. But I've been watching podcasts for for a very long time, whether it was. Joe Rogan's mm -hmm. or Joe Buttons or, you know, the brilliant idiots or it's comedy, Bill Burr, or whatever. And COVID hit mm -hmm. and I was like, nobody can really go out. So how can we do something that's going to entertain people? And I've been talking to Jackie about doing a podcast for God knows how long, you know, and um, I didn't want it to be like the same okay, I'm going to have somebody come on and just shoot the shit with them, right? Like, I wanted people to come on that I genuinely cared for or that I know or that I respect or they have an amazing story. A lot of times, right, and I've seen this a lot during COVID, and this is what it was for me. We give people their flowers when they're dead. Don't wait for me to die to blow my Facebook up to tell me how much you love me, mm -hmm. right? I'm here right now. I love, you know what I mean? And and the hit for me was I'm gonna have my people on and give them their roses now while they're still around to smell them. You know? And then it's just I like talking. I like <laughs> you know what I, mean? I like I like talking, I like shooting the shit. You know? Yeah, yeah. Jack Jackie says, Thank you for your service and sharing your story. Thank Absolutely. You, it was an amazing story. Val Kirk says, you guys are great people. Keep up the good work. Very proud of you, Anthony and TJ. Kelly Ellis says, love you, TJ. Thank you all. Much love to y'all. Yes, thank you so, all. Thank you. I mean, that's pretty much why I do it. You know, keeps me busy. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm not busy enough, said Ann Anthony. <laughs> uh, yeah. Absolutely. I, I, honestly, I thought that, Kelly. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm sitting right here, too, you know. All right. Uh, you know, was, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, uh, thank you, you know, love you guys too. But no, to, uh, but that's that's it's a beautiful thing, right? Because we talked about purpose before too, right? And it's like it it's things I think I feel like not only people that come back from service, but people in, in, in anywhere, right? We all need some form of purpose, some form of of, of being in service that what we're doing um, is is meaningful, right? Is is uh, impacting others lives and, and you know about service work and what that does for us and, and to right. us um you know so we can keep what we have and i believe this is part of like that right so it, it it's it's you know having that purpose and and thank you for doing what you do uh and bringing to light other people's stories um motivations purpose services whatever whatever it may be it's like you're getting that out there and uh and that's what these podcasts are doing too and and uh i listen to all kinds of podcasts too, yeah, um, me too. i got like a 45 minute 50 minute drive to work so it's it's, it's a nice to kind of just to actually listen to, to to bill burr on joe rogan um the last two days you know trying to finish yeah. that up but um but yeah man it's it, it they're all you know they're powerful uh, they hit people. They can hit different people. You have all different walks of life. And I just think, um, you know, I I'm continuing this, you know, and I'll stop. But, uh, you know, thank you uh, for what you do. 
you know, doing this. Because this is not an easy thing to do, by the way. People think they just get on and start talking, but it's like you got to set up things, man. You got to do things, reach, you got to have a, a clientele, <laughs> you know, like like an interesting clientele. And I'm not saying I am, I'm just saying it's like to get No, you definitely engaged, are. you definitely you know, are. You got to get people engaged and 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 um let, let people get outside themselves for a while, you know, and then like it's 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 needed, it's okay. So um, you know, thank you. It's funny, right? I was tossing the idea. I had no idea what I was going to call this show. And, uh, you know, my brother, Alan, Alan Amy, right? He said, you should call it Spitting with Spitter. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Yeah. Think you're on to something. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's that purpose, right? Mm -hmm. It's why I show up. And why I make that cup of coffee, you know what I mean? Yep. And why I offer a smile and a hug. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people won't get it, but I hope that some do. Mm -hmm. You know, for real. Absolutely, it's, it's it's tough, man. It's it's like we see, you know, uh, that stuff far too often than we want to. And, you know, sometimes you wish we can just shake people to get it. You know, and um, Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Uh, but, um, you know, we don't give up on people because, you know, like you said before, man, nobody ever gave up on me, you know, and they didn't. And I'm sitting in this chair be because of that. Um, and then, you know, even my clients are like, why, why don't you just kick me out? Why? And like, because nobody gave up on me, you know, so I'm not I'll never give up on anybody else, you know. Um, and that's just part of my story. Right. And that's that's how I that's how I think, because. There's so many times some people could have just gave up and like that was it. You've you've already had all these opportunities, all these tries. Why should we give you another one? What's gonna right. be different? You know? And something finally clicked when it was supposed to, you know? Yeah. And that's it. That's all I can say about that, you know. And um, I I never like now, now at 40, right? I stopped questioning God's timing. Mm -hmm. And not to get all preachy. But the stop questioning the why it's happening and when it's happening and where it's happening, you know, and just, you know, go with it. Because, like, listen, my my core group never gave like you just said, my core group never gave up on me. You know what I mean? And why I do this now, this wouldn't have been successful. Not and not that it's crazy successful or nothing like that. But at 27 years old, when I was high out of my mind, thinking I was the best bedroom rapper ever. <laughs> to try to to try to portray this to happen, it would have never happened. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. My brother, listen, I can't wait for round two. This was absolutely amazing tonight. Thank you so much for your service, for all you do for everyone else. Thank you for all your service in the military. And thank you for just being a stand-up man that is of integrity today, you know? It's easy to put on a good face and, and show out and not be yourself. But I know who you are, brother. And I love you to the max. Love you too, TJ. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind words. And thank you, everyone. Oh, oh uh, wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait uh, one mother in second. <laughs> it, it would not be a spitting with spitter if I didn't ask you, Anthony Duran, what was in your playlist. Everything. I don't even know. Like thousands of songs of everything. I listen to... Everything from composer, classical music, right? Um, hip hop, rap, classic rock, today's rock, toddler music at the moment in the mornings. Uh, uh, that's the big one. Uh, that's that's what's happening every morning on um, the Echo, as we say, play baby toddler music. And then it has this toddler station. So it has different forms of Gundam style. Um, 24 karat gold, whatever that song is, you know, like a Bruno Mars song, you know, so it's like all these different dinosaur song. So that's on the playlist in the mornings, uh, in case anybody was wondering that uh, for my one year old, because she loves to dance around to that stuff. Um, but if I'm not listening to a baby shark, that's yeah, Lulu, Lulu, um, Lulu kids. That's on there. Not baby shark, uh, the song, but it's they play the baby uh, shark thing. But uh, 
No, man, I do listen to everything. I like, I appreciate music in general. Um, I'll even listen to music with mantras, like uh, um, just to kind of zone out a little bit. Um, I'll listen to, to certain um, classical music when I'm doing work on the computer to kind of like calm the brain a little bit while I can focus better. Um, but usually at work, I put on my shuffle of the thousands of songs that I have. And if I'm whatever the mood is set, that's what's playing, no matter what. Um, that's how I do it. I don't really don't have, there's a gym, you know, playlist that I put that's a little bit more heavier, you know, uh, I have, but, I have one of those as well. Yeah. So, but for the most part, man, there's no, like, I literally listen to everything. Uh, all, all, I'll say almost everything. Can't say everything. Right. But, um, yeah, Thank there's you, country in there. Yeah. Thanks, man. But yeah, no, there, there's really no, uh, um, I literally listen to to that playlist on shuffle and if i want to move for it it'll stay if not it's going to the next one you know and, and that's that's how i do my playlist what what song do you have on repeat that has affected you to where you have it on repeat at times because if, if you're anything like me i've had days the last week or so that it would just be one song for eight hours like for me to escape reality a little, like that's, see, I'm telling on myself now, but like when I'm in, in my bag, I'll put on a song that takes me some someplace so far out of here mm -hmm. and just go with it. See, there, there's songs like that where I will go to when I need that type of experience, right? Where I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, I just need to like, just go somewhere, you know, right. and it's not on shuffle, uh, but it's not on repeat either. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's not on repeat, but um, things that I'll go to, um, it'll be experienced by Ludovico Inaldi as a composer or uh, High Hopes from Pink Floyd um, is, is, a, is a really good one for me. Um, what is oh, she's asking you what that song is? Yeah. 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 I don't so, know if I'm ready to give up that information. <laughs> Actually. <laughs> This it's a, a song from Jelly Roll called Save Me. There, there's there's my little secret for the night. Just like your mom does shuffle songs, all music is good for certain times. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Man, listen, my brother, I can't thank you enough, bro. I can't thank you enough. You're an amazing individual, and I appreciate you the utmost. Music questions out the way. We're here now, man. It's the end now. Thank y'all for... Oh, okay. Hold on. I'm going to listen. Yeah, please do. It's dope. TJ, for, uh, thank you. You know, thank you again uh, for having me on. And thank you, everyone who, who has listened and participated and, you know, spiked my ADD. I really appreciate it. Uh, right? Like, you that's know, I, uh, why I no, don't know I, I really, <laughs> Um, you know, I'm joking about that because I, I, I'm I, it, like I said, it's a humble experience, you know, to, to put myself out there on a lot live. I was like, live, what? There's no edit, there's no like, let's tape and then we edit. Shit. Like, no, this is live. No, no. So, you know, um, it's a little more tricky this way. Yeah. What you see is what you get. And, um, you know, I can appreciate that. I really do. But thank you again. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Absolutely, Anthony. Many blessings to you, my brother. Have a good night as I end yeah. the show. Yes, you too. Thank you. Absolutely, bro. Thank you. Love you. Love you back, brother. For those that tuned in tonight, that was Spitting with Spitter. I'm TJ Spitter. That's Anthony Duran. One last round. Yo, the sponsor for tonight's show was Mom and Pop CBD Shop 312. God, yo, if I could remember, like, that's one thing that 312 Town Center Boulevard, man, go there for all your CBD needs. They have glassware. They have great CBD products. They got this dope pain cream that I use for my old ass knees. Um, also, tune in to 2M1L Media on YouTube. Click the YouTube link. Go like that. This show will be uploaded to there in about 10 minutes. We appreciate everybody for tuning in. Support all our shows. One last time, go tune in to around the turnbuckle Saturday night with the big Al Boski and Professor Keith as they have Stevie Ray, the legend, the WWE Hall of Famer on their show. Anthony, we are out of here, my brother. Have a good night, bro. Yeah, you're right.